Hi guys, welcome back. Um, this is our fifth, I believe, um, lesson, video lesson for Beowulf for our honors class. We are reading the Seamus Haney translation of Beowulf and talking about it and doing our lesson. And so you may want to have your notes open while you have while you read along in the text so you can be like, oh great, and jump back into your notes and add stuff. Um, as you can see, I am using a slightly different audio setup here. I'm hoping that um, I don't have to speak quite so loudly uh, in this one, and also that I can move a little bit more and be a little more comfortable. It's also nice not to have those giant uh, earphones on, but uh, let me know what you think about the setup and if this was okay to listen to or if you preferred the other microphone. Okay, you may get a little more background noise in this mic. It's all right, we'll make it work. When we left off, Beowulf had defeated Grendel. There'd been a gigantic celebration. He'd been showered with gifts by Hrothgar, but we got major foreshadowing that all was not well in the kingdom. And we are picking up on page 89 at line 1251. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Uh, this is all the warriors in Beowulf's, um, I'm sorry, in Hrothgar's hall. They went to sleep, and one paid dearly for his night's ease. As had happened to them often, Ever since Grendel occupied the Gold Hall, committing evil until the end came, death after his crimes. Then it became clear, obvious to everyone once the fight was over, that an Avenger lurked and was still alive, grimly biding time. Okay, and we are not talking about the Marvel Avengers here, nor are we talking about the old BBC series with the kick-butt-wearing leather Avengers. No, 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 no. We are talking about Grendel's mother. Now, two points here. One, remember the connection to Anglo-Saxon culture in your notes? And that we talked about, right, you have to pay a blood price to settle a blood feud, but that Grendel didn't play by those rules. He just continually brought death. Nobody has thought about paying Grendel's mother the blood price here. Like, nobody considered, hmm, he was somebody's kid. He's going to have an avenging family, right? Nobody thought about that. Second thing, um, if someone had murdered you, God forbid, and hung your arm up in as a trophy in their house, don't you think your mama would be coming after them? She would not stand for that sort of behavior. Well, Grendel's mama isn't going to either. Watch what happens. Oh, and by the way, she never gets a name. She's always just Grendel's mother. Make of that what you will. Grendel's mother, monstrous hell bride, Ooh, isn't that good, brooded on her wrongs. She had been forced down into fearful waters, the cold depths, after Cain had killed his father's son, felled his own brother with a sword. Branded an outlaw, marked by having murdered, he moved into the wilds, shunned company and joy, and from Cain there sprang misbegotten spirits, among them Grendel, the banished and accursed, due to come to grips with that watcher in her rot, waiting to do battle. This is like, we're, okay, two things. I know I keep saying that. It's all right. It's my thing. It's one of my two things. <laughs> um, I, she has been forced out into the hinterlands, right? To away from society, away from everyone else, because she's a descendant of Cain and they're murderers. And so is Grendel, blah, blah, blah. And then we get a recap of the fight with Beowulf. Why? We just read it. Why do we have a recap? Well, those of you who remember about the Iliad and the Odyssey, right, remember that these were performed poems. 
And if you're performing a poem this long, you're not doing it in one sitting. So this is a good place where they could take a break and say, oh, well, they went to, they went to sleep, but one of them didn't wake up again. And then come back into the poem at another time, maybe the next night at another celebration or later in the day, and go, remember everything we heard before? Let's pick up the story. So this is like last time on Beowulf. Okay. Uh, so we're picking up with line 1270. But Beowulf was mindful of his mighty strength, the wonderful gifts God had showered on him. He relied for help on the Lord of all, on his care and favor. Okay, here we have, remember that the Anglo-Saxon thing about lords basically giving wealth to their warriors? But this is also getting conflated with the Christian lord who's giving gifts to Beowulf. You know, God gives good gifts, right? So those ideas are, are becoming one idea. So he overcame the foe, brought down the hell brute, broken and bowed, outcast from all sweetness, the enemy of mankind made for his death den. But now his mother has sallied forth on a savage journey, grief racked and ravenous, desperate for revenge. <sighs> Can't you just see her? Can't you just see her lurking through? I'm just taking a couple of these uh, things I'm using to prop my mic and bringing it down a little bit. Okay, you ready? Okay, so we're at the bottom of page 89. She came to her rot. The, and remember, everybody's asleep. There, inside the hall, Danes lay asleep. Oh, you don't have to remember. Our author's going to tell us. Earls who would soon endure a great reversal. Once Grendel's mother attacked and entered. Her onslaught was less only by as much as an Amazon warrior's strength is less than an armed man's when the hefted sword, its hammered edge and gleaming blade slathered in blood, raises the sturdy boar ridge off a helmet. Okay, so... This is happening within a chauvinistic world, right? So they're saying, yeah, she's powerful, she's strong, as strong as a warrior. But remember, Grendel was like even stronger and could kill 30 guys. So they're kind of underestimating her here. And you'll notice uh, as we come up, her body count is lower. Then in the hall, hard honed swords were grabbed from the bench. Many a broad shield lifted and braced. There was little thought of helmets or woven mail when they awoke in terror. So they're all asleep, right? And remember uh, when we left off last time, they sleep with all their armor and swords and everything right next to them. So she comes bursting in the doors and they grab their swords and they grab their shields, but they don't have time to put on their armor. But suddenly they're... The hell dam was in panic, desperate to get out. So she thought she was just going to come get her son's arm, revenge, everything, and suddenly she's got all these armed warriors. In mortal terror, the moment she was found, she had pounced and taken one of the retainers in a tight hold and then headed for the fen. So she's got a man in her hand and is turned around and is running back to her home. To Hrothgar, this man, the guy she's got, was the most beloved of friends he trusted between the two seas. It's Hrothgar's, it's the king's best friend, she scrapped. She had done away with a great warrior, ambushed him at rest, which is really dishonorable, right? Beowulf was elsewhere. <clears throat> Earlier, after the award of the treasure, the Geat had been given another lodging. Okay, this is a very discreet way of saying Beowulf was not in the hall when this happened because Beowulf should have prevented something like this, right? Okay, where might he have been? Go leave it up to your imagination. Where is our boy Beowulf sleeping at the night of the great big party when he is the world's greatest hero? 
I'm, I'm absolutely sure he's in a bed all by himself, completely innocent, and there's definitely um, no hanky-panky or shenanigans whatsoever. Yeah, he's just elsewhere. There was uproar in Herat. She had snatched her trophy, Grendel's bloodied hand. It was a fresh blow to the afflicted Bon. The bargain was hard, both parties having to pay with the lives of friends. And the old lord, the gray-haired warrior, was heart-sore and weary when he heard the news. His highest place advisor, his dearest companion, was dead and gone. Beowulf was quickly brought to the chamber. The winner of fights, the arch-warrior, came first footing in with his fellow troops to where the king in his wisdom waited. Look at all that alliteration there still wondering whether Almighty God would ever turn the tide of his misfortunes. So the king's like, well, I thought things were getting better, but now Grendel's mama has come, killed my favorite best friend, and taken Grendel's arm back, and what, where were you? What, what, what were you doing? So Beowulf entered with his band in attendance, and the wooden floorboards banged and rang as he advanced, hurrying to address the prince of the Ingwins, not a penguin, the Ingwins, asking if he'd rested since the urgent summons had come as a surprise. Then Hrothgar, the shielding's helmet, spoke. Rest? What is rest? Sorrow has returned. Alas for the Danes. Eshagar is dead. Okay, so we get the name of his friend. He was Remlef's elder brother and a soulmate to me, a true mentor. My right-hand man when the ranks clashed and our boar crests had to take a battering in the line of action. Eshagar was everything the world admires in a wise man and in a friend. So he is mourning his friend. So, so what is rest? I'm never going to sleep again. My friend is dead. Then this roaming killer come in a fury and slaughtered him in Harat. Where she is hiding, glutting on the corpse and glorying in her escape, I cannot tell. Okay, he can though, and he's going to in a minute. <laughs> he knows where she lives. She has taken up the feud because of last night when you killed Grendel, wrestled and racked him in ruinous combat since for too long he had terrorized us with his depredations. He died in battle paid with his life, and now this powerful other one arrives, this force for evil driven to avenge her kinsman's death, or so it seems to Thanes in their grief. So they know what she's about, and they're not mad that she's mad. He's mad that his best friend died. Like, he, they see this as justified that she's come back. In the anguish every Thane endures at the loss of a ring giver, now the hand that bestowed so richly has been stilled in death. I've heard it said in my by my people in Hall, counselors who live in the upland country, that they have seen two such creatures prowling the moors, huge marauders from some other world. Ooh. You know, that one, that line actually reminds me, did you ever see the, um, the Godzilla that came out a few years back? where they, it was set in like San Francisco and they were the two other creatures. Now I know like they're a mating pair in the Godzilla thing, but the idea of like two huge creatures marauding around and people are like, oh, that's where I've seen them. That just, that's what went into my head. Yes, I'm a nerd, you're welcome. Okay, picking up on 95 uh, on line 1349. One of these things, as far as anyone ever can discern, looks like a woman. The other, warped in the shape of a man, moves beyond the pale bigger than any man, an unnatural birth called Grendel by country people in former days. They are fatherless creatures. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. But the idea that they're unnatural you know that because they keep tracing like his father his father his father well Grendel doesn't have a father okay and their whole ancestry is hidden in a past of demons and ghosts they dwell apart among wolves on the hills on windswept crags and treacherous keshes where cold streams pour down the mountain and disappear under mist 
and moorland. Okay, we we are about to set get well we've got some there we're about to get more absolutely gorgeous imagery i mean creepy and horrific but gorgeously described so you know in your notes where it says imagery these lines would be really good to put there okay uh picking up on line three six thirteen sixty two a few miles from here a frost st frost stiffened wood waits and keeps watch above a mirror. The overhanging bank is a maze of tree roots mirrored in its surface. At night there, something uncanny happens. The water burns. And at the bot mere bottom has never been sounded by the sons of men. Um, so uh, to sound water, those of you who are fishermen, you know this. Um, now we do it with sonar, right? You send out sonar signals from your boat to kind of see the shapes and see what's under the water, see how deep the water is. What they used to do is literally drop a string with a rock to see how deep the water was. And that was called sounding. They used to do it up and down the Mississippi River. So they're like, no one knows how deep this water is. It's never been sounded. But every night the water burns. Okay, you ready for some creepy emo gothic stuff here we go on its bank the heather stepper halts the heart the heather stepper would be like um like a rabbit the heart in flight from pursuing hounds will turn to face them with firm set horns and die in the wood rather than dive beneath its surface that is no good place it's the bad place they're in the bad place so even animals are afraid of this lake. Even fully grown bucks, and those of you who are hunters know that those are huge, with huge horns. If they're being chased by hunters, instead of going into the water to get away from the hunters, they will turn and face the hunters and be killed rather than go in this water. This is bad water. Okay, moving to line 96. When wind blows up and stormy weather makes clouds scud and the skies weep, out of its depths a dirty surge is pitched towards the heavens. Now help depends again on you, and you alone, Hrothgar, needs you. The gap of danger where the demon waits is still unknown to you. Seek it, if you dare. I will compensate you for settling the feud as I did the last time with lavish wealth, coil, coffers of coiled gold, if you come back. Okay, so Beowulf's been issued the challenge, please go deal with Grendel's mother and I will reward you like I did before, if you come back. Okay, we'll see Beowulf's response. Beowulf isn't going to go, bye! No, is he? He's going to deal with this. Beowulf, son of Ekthrow, spoke. Wise sir, do not grieve. It is always better to avenge dear ones than to indulge in mourning. Um, no, I disagree with you there, Beowulf. Mourn all you want and don't go for revenge. But this tells us who Beowulf is, right? Okay. For every one of us, living in this world means waiting for our end. Let whoever can win glory before death. When a warrior is gone, that will be his best and only bulwark. So arise, my lord, and let us immediately set forth on the trail of this troll dam. So Beowulf's like, don't sit here and cry. Let's go get her. Posse up, boys. I guarantee you she will not get away. Not to dens underground, nor to upland groves, nor the ocean floor. She'll have nowhere to flee to. Endure your troubles today. Bear up and be the man I expect you to be. With that, the old lord sprang to his feet and praised God for Beowulf's pledge. Then a bit and halter were brought for his horse with the plated mane. Remember the horse he gave Beowulf? The wise king mounted the royal saddle and rolled, rode out in style with the force of shield bearers. With the force of shield bearers. The forest paths were marked all over with the monster's tracks. 
her trail on the ground wherever she had gone across the dark moors, dragging away the body of that thane, Hrothgar's best counselor and overseer of the country. So the noble prince proceeded, undismayed, up fells and screes. Screes are like um, loose banks of, of uh, stones. Along narrow footpaths and ways where they were forced into single file ledges on cliffs above layers of water monsters. So this is like a series of really terrible places. <laughs> and they are, they're on this journey. He went in front with a few men, good judges of the lay of the land, so he goes with good guys who know how to navigate the land, and suddenly discovered the dismal wood, mountain trees growing out in an angle above gray stones. The bloodshot water surged underneath. Why is it bloodshot? Right, because Grendel bled out in that water, and now this guy... Um, Hrothgar's best man has bled out in that water. So there's... Ugh. It was a sore blow to all the Danes, friends of the Shieldings, a hurt to each and every one, that that noble company, when they came upon Asher's head at the foot of the cliff. So she's left his head where they could see it at the foot of the cliff marking her territory. She's a hard one. Okay. P we're on page 99 and we're picking up on 422. Everybody gazed as the hot gore kept wallowing up and the urgent war horn, re horn repeated its notes. The whole party sat down to watch. The water was infested with all kinds of reptiles. There were writhing sea dragons and monsters slouching on slopes by the cliff, serpents and wild things such as those that often surface at dawn to roam the sail road and doom the voyage. Okay, first, this is a phenomenally creepy, horrific lake of demons, monsters, and other crazy creatures here, right? Second, remember uh, one of the things of Old English is kennings, right? One of the elements of Old English. And the idea of um, the sail road, S-A-I-L, instead of just calling it an ocean. It's a sail road. It's really good. It's a kenning. Notes, 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 please. Down they plunged, lashing in anger at the loud call of the battle bugle. An arrow from the bow of the Geat chief got one of them as he surged to the surface. The seasoned shaft sunk deep in his flank, and his freedom in the water got less and less. It was his last swim. He was swiftly overwhelmed in the shallows, prodded by barbed boar spears, cornered, beaten, pulled up on the bank, a strange lake berth, a loathsome catch. Men gazed in awe. Okay, so we've got like one creature, crocodile, whatever it is, that they speared and then dragged to the shore and killed. But you almost feel sorry for it, but it's to show how dangerous this water is, right? Now, Beowulf is going to go in alone because that's how Beowulf do. Ready? Beowulf got ready, donned his war gear, indifferent to death, his mighty hand-forged, fine-webbed mail that would soon meet with the menace underwater. It would keep the bone cage of his body safe. Oh, there's another good kenning. Instead of your ribs, your bone cage. So good. Okay. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Do you remember back at the beginning of the story when Unferth was ragging on Beowulf and was like, well, you never won that swimming contest with Brekka. And Beowulf was like, no, I didn't, but I killed all these nine sea monsters. That's foreshadowing here, isn't it? Because we know Beowulf can swim in armor. He can swim with a sword. He can kill sea monsters. So we're going to see him do some of the things he bragged about doing. It would keep the bone cage of his body safe. No enemy's clasp could crush him in it. 
No vicious arm lock could choke his life out. To guard his head, he had a glittering helmet that was due to be muddied in the mere bottom and blurred in the upswell. So we're actually getting a little foreshadowing that this helmet is going to end up on the bottom of this lake. It was of beaten gold, princely headgear hooped and hasped by a weaponsmith who had worked wonders in days gone by and adorned it with boar shapes. Since then, it had resisted every sword. Okay, um, one point, just one. Why is his armor made of gold? We talked about this before, didn't we? Mm-hmm, because gold doesn't rust. Good. And another item, lent by Unferth at that moment of need, was of no small importance. The Brihan, the, the guy, handed him a hilted weapon, it's a sword, a rare and ancient sword named Hrunting. The iron blade with its ill-boding patterns had been tempered in blood. This, had, this is a sword that had been in battle before. It had never failed the hand of anyone who'd hefted it in battle, anyone who had fought or faced the worse in the gap of danger. This was not the first time it had been called to perform heroic feats. Now, why is Unferth giving him a sword? Wasn't Unferth the guy who was giving him a hard time? Yes and yes. Remember, the king has honored Beowulf, right? And Unferth has kind of apologized and backed down. And so he's giving him his, like, family sword as a, almost like an apology present, but also to say, like, hey, you deserve this. When he lent that sword to the better swordsman, it's, yeah, admitting that Beowulf's better than he is, Unferth, the strong-built son of Eklof, could hardly have remembered the ranting speech he made in his cups. He, he didn't even remember what he said when he was drunk. He was not man enough to face the turmoil of a fight underwater and the risk to his life. So there, he lost fame and repute. It was different for the other rigged out in his gear, ready to do battle. So, again... Unferth, he apologizes, he, you know, gives Beowulf his sword, but he actually acknowledges, and the narrator is acknowledging, Beowulf is just a better man than Unferth is. Beowulf is braver, he's stronger, he's more courageous. Unferth isn't willing to do those things. Beowulf, son of Ekthrow, spoke. So they're all, remember they're on the shore of this lake. The king's there on his horse. Wisest of kings, now that I have come to the point of action, I ask you to recall what we said earlier, that you, son of Healthdane, and gold friend to retainers, that you, if I should fall and suffer death while serving your cause, would act like a father to me afterwards. If this combat kills me, take care of my young company, my comrades in arms, and be sure also my beloved Hrothgar to send Higelac the treasures I received. Let the Lord of the Geats gaze on that gold. Let Hrethel's son take note of it and see that I bought, I found a ring giver of rare magnificence and enjoyed the good of his generosity. And Unferth is to have what I inherited. To that far-famed man, I bequeath my own sharp-honed, wave-sheened wonder blade. With hunting, I shall gain glory or die. Okay, so this is his, like, final will and testament delivered to the king before he dives into this lake. He gives Unferth his own sword and takes Unferth's sword into the water. And he begs him, please, uh, king, if I die, take care of my men, send my treasure back to my king. One, to show him that I earned honor from you, and two to better your rep reputation as giving such great gifts. Nobody has time to talk Beowulf out of going by himself, though, because look at the bottom of page 103, line uh, 1492. After these words, the prince of the Weathergeats was impatient to be away and plunged suddenly, without much more ado, he dived into the heaving depths of the lake. It was the best part of a day before he could see the solid bottom. So that's how deep this lake is. He sank all day. Now, 
normally, if you are sinking, you're drowning, particularly wearing metal armor, right? But uh, <laughs> Beowulf doesn't have time for drowning. Uh, they never explain to us how he breathes underwater. It just is not important to the poet. He does it because he's Beowulf. Okay. Quickly, the one who haunted these waters, this would be Grendel's mother, who had scavenged and gone her gluttonous rounds for a hundred seasons, sensed a human observing her outlandish lair from above. So she lunged and clutched and managed to catch him in her brutal grip. But his body, for all of that, remained unscathed. The mesh of the chainmail saved him on the outside. He knew it would, right? It's a good thing he wore it. Her savage talons, I don't have much of them at the moment, failed to rip the web of his war shirt. So she's trying to tear his armor, but she just can't. And can't you hear the nails against the metal? <sighs> when once she touched bottom, that wolfish swimmer carried the ring-mailed prince to her court so that for all his courage, he could never use the weapons he carried. And a bewildering horde came at him from the depths. Droves of sea beasts who attacked with tusks and tore at his chain mail in a ghastly onslaught. The gallant man could see he had entered some hellish turnhole and yet, the water did not work against him, because the hall roofing held off the force of the current. When he saw firelight, a gleam and flare-up, a glimmer of brightness. Okay, so she's dragged him to the bottom of the lake, and as she's dragging him along to her home, he's being torn at by all these creatures in the water. You know, they're trying to bite him and tear him with his tusks, but he's wearing the armor. She's holding him so tightly, he can't move his sword. He can't swing. But they get into this war hall, and it's got a roof on it. So the currents of the water aren't, he's not fighting, he's not having to swim against currents. And there's a fire in this hall, like a fireplace. So it must, there must be air? I don't know, but I guess so. So this is some kind of like ruined underwater war mead hall castle thing. Really good and gothic and creepy. Okay. The hero observed that swamp thing from hell, the tarn hag, in all her terrible strength, then heaved his war sword and swung his arm. The decorated blade came down ringing and singing on her head. So he, he swung his sword finally and just bam, right down on the middle of her head. And nothing. But he soon found his battle torch extinguished. The shining blade refused to bite. It spared her and failed the man in his need. The, the sword goes boing, basically. It doesn't harm her at all. And, and he's blaming it on the sword. It had gone through many hand-to-hand -hand fights, had hewn the armor and helmets of the doomed, but here, at last, the fabulous powers of that heirloom failed. Higlock's kinsmen kept thinking about his name and fame. He never lost heart. So all he keeps thinking about is like, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, they're going to talk about me, I've got to, you know, never like, oh my god. He's not praying. This is that weird combination of paganism and Christianity, right? But his sword isn't any good. How's he feel? Incredibly frustrated, right? Then, in a fury, he flung his sword away. The keen, inlaid, worm-looped, patterned steel was hurled to the ground. He would have to rely on the might of his arm, just like he did with, with Beowulf. So must a man do who intends to gain enduring glory in a combat. Life doesn't cost him a thought. So our narrator pretty chatty in this section. He's got lots of, you know, things he wants us to learn. Then the prince of Wargeats, warming to this fight with Grendel's mother, gripped her shoulder and laid about him in a battle frenzy. He pitched his killer opponent to the floor. So he grabs like a wrestling move. He grabs her shoulders and pushes her to the floor. But 
She rose quickly and retaliated, grappled him tightly in her grim embrace. The sure-footed fighter felt daunted. The strongest of warriors stumbled and fell. So she pounced upon him and pulled out a broad, wetted knife. Now she would re avenge her only child. Okay, so he's laying flat on his back on the floor. She's standing over him, or in some versions, she's actually like sitting or or kneeling on his stomach and she has a blade in her hand she is about to stab him and avenge Grendel's death but the mesh of chainmail on Beowulf's shoulder shielded his life so she stabs him but it's stopped by the chainmail turned the edge and tip of the blade the son of Ekthrau would have surely perished, and the Geats lost their warrior under the wide earth, had the strong links and locks of his war gear not helped save him. Holy God decided the victory. It was easy for the Lord, the ruler of heaven, to redress the balance, once Beowulf got back up on his feet. Okay, now, we're about to see the tide turn on this battle, and the reference to God is really well placed. In your notes, the elements of an epic, one of the elements of the epic in that downloadable page I had you guys do, was called Deus Ex Machina. And it's a Latin phrase meaning God in the machine. We've talked about this before when we talked about Shakespeare, I'm sure. The deal with Deus Ex Machina is that when you have a hero, heroic character who's in such a tight spot, so outnumbered, so overwhelmed, so overpowered, that the only thing that could possibly save them is a solution, kind, usually magic of some kind or supernatural of some kind, that comes out of nowhere. Um, this happens all the time in the Marvel films, right? The, the the hero is about to fight the enemy, the enemy's overwhelming them, they're about to lose and suddenly another Avenger pops out of nowhere, right? Um, and, and you get the music come up. Uh, we're about to have a deus ex machina moment. It's called God in the Machine because in the ancient Roman theater, and it's a Latin phrase, uh, they had in the ceiling was a trap door, basically. And during the plays, you'd often have a character playing one of the gods come down on a rope, on a pulley system, right, a machine, come down out of the ceiling trapdoor and solve whatever problem was happening in the play. And so the idea of God in the machine coming down to save the day. This is exactly what's about to happen in the poem. So Beowulf is out, out fought, right? And although his chainmail kept him from being killed, he's really in a tight spot. Then he saw a blade that boded well a sword in her armory, an ancient heirloom from the days of the giants, an ideal weapon, one that any warrior would envy, but so huge and heavy of itself, only Beowulf could wield it in a battle. Well, that's convenient, right? So he looks over, looking for anything to help, and he looks up and sees this gigantic sword, and he grabs it. So the shielding's hero, hard-pressed and enraged, took firm hold of the hilt and swung the blade in an arc, a resolute blow that bit deep into her neck bone and severed it entirely, toppling the doomed house of her flesh. She fell to the floor. The sword dripped blood. The swordsman was elated. <sighs> so in one swift movement, he grabs the sword, pulls it out of the hilt, and cuts her head off. Decapitation! Right? And her head falls off and her body tumbles. A light appeared, and the place brightened the way the sky does when the heaven's candle is shining clearly. Heaven's candle here, a good canning for the sun. So the minute he kills Grendel's mother, the water lightens. Remember this water that's been so dark and awful and there's a, there's a bright light. He inspected the vault. Beowulf's still holding the sword, dripping with blood, and he's inspecting and going around the castle, 
or the underwater lair. With the sword held high, its hilt raised to guard and threaten, Higlock Thane scouted by the wall in Grendel's wake. Now the weapon was to prove its worth, like it hadn't already. The warrior determined to take revenge for every gross act Grendel had committed, and not only for that one occasion when he came to slaughter the sleeping troops, fifteen of Hrothgar's house guards surprised on their benches and ruthlessly devoured, and as many again carried away a brutal plunder. Beowulf, in his fury, now settled that score. He saw the monster in his resting place, war-weary and wrecked, a lifeless corpse, a casualty of the battle in Herat. The body gaped at the stroke dealt to it after death. Beowulf cut the corpse's head off. Okay, why? Why is he seeking revenge on something that's already dead? Okay, one, this tells us a little bit about him as a person, right? He's killed Grendel's mother with one hit, and he still has all that adrenaline and all that, like, that battle angst, and now that, just, oh, he's still got to go kill something, but everything's dead. Uh, the other thing is, as he's going around and he sees Grendel's dead body, remember, he wanted Grendel's body as a trophy earlier, right? He wanted to kill him, but it didn't happen because he tore the arm off and Grendel ran away and he didn't really get to like kill the body so he has cut his head off in a very like definitive way of I'm your killer and he's going to take that head as a trophy to replace the arm that Grendel's mother stole stole back okay now we're going to change perspective real quick and this is an interesting thing at the bottom of 109 page 109 Remember, Beowulf dived into the water, like, early in the morning, and now it's almost been the whole day. It's probably at night. And these guys have been sitting by the shore waiting for him the whole time. Now, what are they going to think when all this blood from Grendel's mother is going to come up through the water, right? What are they going to think? So, bottom of 109. Immediately, the counselors, keeping a lookout... With Hrothgar, watching the lake water, saw a heave up and surge of waves and blood in the backwash. They bowed gray heads, spoke in their sage, experienced way about the good warrior, how they never again expected to see that prince returning in triumph to their king. It was clear to many the wolf of the deep had destroyed him forever. Isn't that great? It's like a movie. So all his friends, all his loyal guys, the king, everybody thinks he's dead, standing on the shore. The ninth hour of the day arrived. The brave shieldings abandoned the clifftop, and the king went home. So the king and all his men, they're going home. Beowulf's dead. He's not coming back. But sick at heart, staring at the mirror, the strangers held on. The strangers are Beowulf's men. They wished without hope to behold their lord Beowulf himself. Meanwhile, so now we're back under the water, the sword began to wilt in gory icicles to slather and thaw. It was a wonderful thing, the way it all melted as ice melts when the father eases the fetters off the frost and unravels the water ropes. Oh, have you ever seen an icicle melt? They're, they're calling that unraveling the water rope. He who wields power over time and tide, he is the true Lord. Right, so coming in and reminding us, okay, well, maybe Hrothgar gave up hope, but God doesn't. But this, this, this magical sword that he's killed them both with, the, their blood is melting the metal of the sword. So all he's going to be left with is the hilt, the handle of the sword. The Geat captain saw treasure in abundance, but n carried no spoils from those quarters, except for the head and the inlaid hilt embossed with jewels. Its blade had melted and the scroll work on it burnt. So scalding was the blood of the poisonous fiend who had perished there. But there's all kinds of treasure down there in that thing, but Beowulf doesn't take any of it, except 
the handle of the sword, and Grendel's head. Then away he swam, the one who had survived the fall of his enemies, flailing to the surface. The wide water, the waves and pools were no longer infested once the wandering fiend let go of her life and this unreliable world. The seafarer's leader made for land, resolutely swimming, delighted with his prize, the mighty load he was lugging to the surface. His thanes advanced in a troop to meet him, thanking God and taking great delight in seeing their prince back, safe and sound. Quickly the hero's helmet and mail shirt were loosened and unlaced. The lake settled, clouds darkened above the bloodshot depths. We're almost done. So Beowulf has brought the, the, the hilt and Grendel's head, he's emerged out of the water, and the men who thought he was dead and had given up hope see their leader coming out of the water. And all those creatures that were in the water, when Beowulf's mother was killed, they're gone. And we're going to read one last little piece. With high hearts, they headed away among footpaths and trails through the fields, roads that they knew, each of them wrestling with the head they were carrying from the lakeside. Men kingly in their courage and capable of difficult work. It was a task for four to hoist Grendel's head on a spear and bear it under strain to the bright hall. But soon enough, they neared the place, fourteen geats in fine fettle, striding across the outlying ground in a delighted throng around their leader. So there's a, they've got Grendel's head balanced or, or speared, and they're carrying it, and it's actually making their spears bend it's so heavy uh, and they're in this joyful group and they're heading back to the mead hall to surprise king hrothgar and we will stop there for this time okay i know that was a good section all right so you're going to go into your notes you're going to add what we learned in this section um, and pay particular attention to that imagery because it was so good all right and i will see you again when we see how they celebrate this victory. Bye everybody.